Many bearings can withstand both radial and axial loading. In the first two videos for bearings, we developed some math expressions to translate the radial load and operation time to a catalog load rating. This allows us to select a proper bearing for a specific application where we know the loads that go into a bearing that is in the radial direction and its operation life. In the last video, we brought in our capabilities for selecting an appropriate bearing by taking into account reliability as well. However, we are still limited to radial loads only. Today, we will learn how to combine the thrust, which I will constantly use interchangeably with the term axial load, and the radial loads into one equivalent radial load FE. This allows us to keep using everything we've learned so far by integrating the thrust into the equivalent load. Now, this is not as simple as adding them together or finding a resultant vector by using thrust and radial values as its components. By defining a rotation factor, capital V, we can write two dimensionless variables Fe over Vfr and Fa over Vfr. V is equal to 1 for when the inner ring is the one rotating, and it's equal to 1.2 when the outer ring is the one rotating. This is just to make up for the extra strain that is caused when the thrust is applied on the outer ring, which is located at a farther distance from the center of the ring. But like many other things we've discussed before, the 1.2 value is what has been obtained or generalized from experimental results. When these two dimensionless variables are plotted against each other, with Fe on the y-axis and Fa on the x-axis, and we plot results from testing experiments, we see two different sections. The first one is an almost straight horizontal line, and the second one is also a straight line, but it has a slope we're gonna call capital Y. The abscissa, for when the x-axis value is E, is where the intersection between these lines occur. Therefore, Fe over V times Fr is just 1 for values of x less or equal to E, and Fe over V times Fr is equal to the equation of a straight line for values of x greater or equal to E. In this case, y is the slope, like I said before, and capital X is the y-intercept. Combining these two equations into one, we can write them as Fe equal xi vfr plus yi fa. For fa over vfr less than e, xi would be 1 and yi would be 0. And for fa over vfr greater than e, xi is 0.56 and the slope will change depending on the basic static loading C0. Just to clarify, the x value of 0.56 here is just an example for ball bearings. Depending on the type of bearing, the x variable will change, but its value will remain constant regardless of the value of C0. Only the slope would vary for calculating that equivalent force for x values greater than e. This basic static loading C0 is defined as the load that would produce a total permanent deformation of 0.1% the diameter of the rolling element. C0 is usually accompanying C10 in the manufacturer's catalogs or websites. The capital Y value, the slope of the relationship between the Y and the X axis of the plot, will depend on the value of FA over C0, and you can find tables where the capital Y value is listed. These values and tables can be looked up by searching for equivalent radial load factors of ball bearings, and they also include the value for the abscissa E. Therefore, the first thing you need to calculate after finding the radial loads and the thrust that goes into your bearing is the ratio Fa over C0, as this will determine the value of the abscissa E and, if needed, the slope. Since the abscissa E is on the x-axis of this plot and the x-axis is F over VFR, you then take the thrust, which is the axial load, and the radial load to calculate F over VFR to compare it with E. If it's less than E, you know Y is 0 and X is 1. If it's greater than E, then you use the capital X and Y values from the table to calculate your equivalent load Fe. This means that the thrust, or in other words the axial loads, can be small enough that they don't affect the equivalent load. Even though both exist, in some cases where the thrust is low, your equivalent load is still just the radial force we had been working with. Of course, you'd still take the V equals to 1.2 into account if the outer ring is the one rotating. But in general, the statement is the same. Small thrust loads can be negligible. When are they negligible? When the Fa over VFR value is lower than E.
If FA over VFR is not lower than E, then the axial load is not negligible and you get your equivalent radial load by looking up the capital X and the capital Y coefficients from a radial load factors table for the type of bearing you're using. Two additional things to point out before looking at today's example. For self-aligning bearings, which are a kind of bearing that has two rows of balls with one track on the outer ring and two tracks on the inner ring, and it can therefore still allow rotation of the shaft even when it's at an angle, the rotation factor V is always 1, even for the outer ring. These ball bearings are used in applications where you know that the shaft will undergo substantial deflection and will therefore rotate at an angle with respect to the housing of the bearing. The second clarification is that straight or cylindrical roller bearings cannot take high axial loads. The axial loads they can take are in fact so low that you don't even need to check for FA over VFR being less than the E value. You always assume that your equivalent load is just your radial load and of course with V equal to 1.2 if the outer ring is the one rotating. Okay, so for today's example, for an angular contact ball bearing that has a static load rating of 4,500 pounds and a load rating C10 of 8,000 pounds, how long would it last if it is subjected to a thrust of 380 pounds and a radial load of 475 pounds? The bearing is located on a shaft that rotates at 680 revs per minute, and let's assume that the manufacturer rates its bearings for a life of 1 million cycles. Since there was no mention of a desired reliability, I will just stick to whatever the manufacturer offers. I also know that on the same line of reliability, the F times L to the 1 over A has to be constant. The manufacturer's load is the rating load C10 and the life they use is L10. This has to be equal to the same variables for the desired operation point. And I know that because I have an axial load in this case, the load is not just going to be the radial force, but an equivalent force. This means that I can calculate the life of my bearing if I figure out what that equivalent radial force is. Since the question is asking for the life in time, knowing that the bearing is rotating at 680 RPM, and I know that the number of cycles is equal to the speed times the time and correcting for units, I can solve for the life in time in terms of the other variables. L10 and C10 are given by the manufacturer. The rotation speed N I know from the information of the problem and the A exponent would be equal to 3 since I'm dealing with a ball bearing. This means that to find the life, I first need to find the equivalent load Fe. I know that there's two options here. If the axial load is low enough, it can be negligible. And I know this happens when Fa over Vfr is lower than the value E. But at the same time, E is given by the Fa over C0 value. So I'll start there. With the given thrust of 380 pounds and the static load rating of 4,500 pounds, I find a value of 0.084 that will allow me to find the E value. With this, I know that E is equal to 0.28. If I calculate FA over VFR, with FR being the radial load also given to me, I find a value that is in fact greater than E. This means that the thrust, or the axial load, is not negligible, and that to find the equivalent load Fe, I do indeed need to find the capital X and capital Y values. Within that same table, for equivalent radial load factors, I will find what I need. The equivalent load will be equal to 0.56 for X times 1 for V times the radial load plus the slope of 155 times the axial load of 380. Worth pointing out here is that if your value for Fa over C0 is not exactly a value on the table, you would need to interpolate to find the values of E, X, and Y. You can find an example where we actually need to interpolate in one of the links of the description of this video. With the new equivalent force of 855 pounds, I can go back and find the life in hours of this bearing that is rotating at 680 RPM. Notice that the only difference here today is that I'm not using a radial force, but an equivalent force. So the only extra step really is to find the axial load over the C0 value, to find the value of E, and determine if I need to take into account the axial load, and therefore the capital X and capital Y coefficients, to find my equivalent load. Everything else is what we had been doing before. So even if I wanted to find the life for a different reliability, I would follow the steps that we covered during our previous video, link below, 
and use the equivalent load of 855 instead of a given radial load. As I mentioned before, don't forget to check out the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.